I'm here to tell you about the work that we're doing on the Genographic Project, which is a different kind of crowdsourcing. It is certainly crowdsourcing data. Ultimately, what we do is we convert all of this stuff that we're collecting from the crowd into data, and that's how we analyze it and how people interact with it. But we're actually crowdsourcing a biological substance, something that's very kind of intimate, your DNA, a blueprint to make another version of you. And that's kind of inherent in what I do as a scientist. Um, my goal as a scientist, I'm a population geneticist by training, geneticist and anthropologist, if you will. My goal as a scientist is, is really to explain the patterns of human diversity we see when we look around the world. And to do that, we have to study lots of people. We have to crowdsource that. Um, it's, it's the very essence of what it is we're doing. We're comparing one person to a, a lot of other people. Now, as with any big quest in science, this effort to understand human diversity can be broken down into sub-questions that we can kind of chip away at using the tools of science. And the first question we can ask is one of origins. Okay, we seem to be so diverse as a species. Do we all come from the same place? Are we all related to each other? And if so, when do we share recent common ancestors? And where did they live? Where did we all come from? Question of origin. And a question of journey as well. So if we do spring from a common source as a species, if we can trace our ancestry back to a handful of people living in a particular place somewhere on the planet at some point in the past, how did we kind of explode out of that small location and expand around the entire globe in the process generating these patterns of diversity that we see today? Well, this quest to understand the human story, origins and journeys, um, it traditionally has taken place by going out and digging things up out of the ground. The study of paleoanthropology and its sister science, archaeology. Um, finding something like a skull in Africa, let's say, and saying largely on the basis of morphology, this looks a little bit more like my cousin Frank than that does. This must be the, the common ancestor of all of us. This is the missing link. This is where we came from. What I'd like to suggest, though, as a scientist, is that while the field of paleoanthropology and archaeology gives us lots of fascinating possibilities about these questions of origins and journey. It doesn't give us the probabilities about direct lines of descent back to these potential ancestors that we really want. This is a great example. What you're looking at in this slide are three extinct species of hominid, potential human ancestors. We could be related to these guys. From left to right, it's Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and Paranthropus boisei, a robust Australopithecine, all uncovered from the same location. Lake Turkana in northern Kenya, and all dating to roughly the same time, about two million years ago. So we've got three potential ancestors living in the same place at the same time. That means that not all three could have left descendants down to the present day and to me. So which one of these guys am I actually related to? I don't know. Possibilities about origins and journey, but not the probabilities we really want as scientists. Well, we as geneticists take a slightly different approach. Instead of digging things up out of the past and guessing at how they may or may not connect up to the present, we start in the present and we work our way back in time. In effect, it's a genealogical approach, trying to build a family tree for everybody alive today. Everybody alive today had parents, and they had parents, and they had parents. So you can trace the lineage in reverse, going back in time, eventually building out the branches of your tree. Now, lots of people are very interested in genealogy. It's the second most popular hobby in the world after gardening, it turns out. And it's poised to overtake gardening, I'm, I'm told by some of the genealogists. Um, and you know, there are probably people in the audience who have constructed a family tree. Anybody out there ever built a family tree? How far back could you go? Great great-grandparents. Great great-grandparents. So that's pretty far back. Anybody further than that? Oh, this is the UK. Surely somebody can get back to the time of you know, Charles V or <laughs> something like that. Uh, so it, the point is that it, no matter how much you know about your genealogy, and there are people who can trace back through the Norman invasion all the way back to the time of Charlemagne. For some reason, it tends to end around Charlemagne. That's the deepest anybody seems to be able to go. But even for people who can trace back you know, that, that huge amount of time in, into the past, eventually they reach a point where there is no written record and we enter this dark and mysterious realm we simply call history, and ultimately prehistory in my field. But it turns out that we're all carrying what is in effect a genealogical or historical document inside of ourselves, inside of nearly every cell in our body, in our DNA. And that DNA allows us to see back through all those generations that we can perhaps name using a, this genealogical family tree approach, but even beyond that, back to the very earliest days of our species. Now, a quick primer 
on DNA. For those of you who have not taken molecular genetics recently, there is going to be a quiz at the end of this. Um, long linear molecule, the famous double helix described by Watson and Crick just down the road at Cambridge University um, back in the 1950s, composed of four subunits. We denote them A, C, G, and T. And it's the sequence of all these A's, C's, G's, and T's, billions of them in the human genome, that basically provides a blueprint to make another version of you. And it is a lot of information, billions of these things. So if you took all of the DNA out of just one tiny microscopic cell in your body and stretched it end to end, it would be about six feet long. If you took all the DNA out of every cell in your body and stretched that end to end, it would reach from here to the sun and back hundreds of times. It's a lot of information. And in every generation, you have to copy this information to pass it on. That's really what reproduction is all about. It's copying your DNA and passing it on to your kids and ultimately grandkids and, and so on. And it's a lot of information to copy. So think of the, the longest text, the longest book you can imagine. Most people are thinking, War and Peace. OK, War and Peace, but a 1,000 volumes of that. You've got to copy a 1,000 volumes of War and Peace by hand in about eight hours, which is how long it takes your, your cells to replicate your DNA. So what are you going to do? You're going to drink lots of coffee and get set and go back and forth, back and forth, double checking, because this is really important information. You have to get it right. But inevitably, no matter how carefully you proofread, what's going to happen? You make a typo. This happens at the DNA level as well. They're called mutations. They occur at a very low but a measurable rate of around 100 mutations per genome per generation. So that 100, 100 novel changes being introduced to the genome every time it's copied and passed on to the next generation. Now, when these mutations get passed on to kids, grandkids, great-grandkids, increase in frequency, they become markers of descent. If you share one of these changes, one of these markers in your DNA with another person, it means you share an ancestor, a person in the past who first had that change in their DNA and passed it on to the two of you. That's how we connect people up into ever deeper branches of the human family tree. Now, what do these markers actually look like? Well, this is actual DNA sequence data. Five people have had, I don't know if you can see. No, we're not, don't have a pointer, do we? That, huh, there we go. OK, so five people have had the same region of their genome sequenced. One, two, three, four, five. And they're lined up. The first thing you notice when you're scanning down through these sequences is that they're basically identical. And that's the first thing that comes out of every one of our studies of human genetic diversity. Humans are 99.9% .9 identical at the DNA level. We only differ on average at one in every thousand nucleotide positions from somebody we're not even related to. That's a remarkably low level of genetic variation, it turns out, comparing to, say, chimps and gorillas and orangs. So it's actually very difficult to find these genetic markers. But if you look carefully enough, down here, if I can find that, it's a little bit dim. Down here in this region, that GGG, scan up to the top, and you'll see a GAG. That single letter change from a G to an A is a genetic marker. If you share that A, you share an ancestor with another person. By looking at people from all over the world, and simply asking a very open-ended scientific question, what is the pattern of diversity? And what does it look like out there in this sequence space that we're dealing with? Focusing in particular on two pieces of DNA that have proven to be incredibly important to our understanding of the origin and journey questions. Mitochondrial DNA, which takes you back in a purely female line of descent. So everybody has mitochondrial DNA, but only women pass it on. So you got it from your mother. She got it from her mother. So it traces a purely maternal line of descent. The equivalent on the, the, the male side, the Y chromosome, which makes men men, that's the little chunk of a chromosome that makes men men, um, guys get it from their fathers. So it tells you about your father's 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 father. By looking at the pattern of these markers for both the mitochondrial DNA and the Y chromosome and men, from, men and women from all over the world, we've been able to construct family trees for everybody alive today. Everybody in this room, in fact, everybody walking around on planet Earth today falls somewhere onto one of the branches in these trees. Now, these are actually really simplified versions of the trees that we use in constructing the assays that we do in the laboratory. But they still look kind of complicated, sitting out there in the audience, squinting at what are those letters over there on the Y chromosome and so on. Let's simplify them even more, combine them, turn them on the side, 
so that they look like a regular tree with the root at the bottom, branches coming off the top. What's the take home message here? Well, it's that the longest branches on both of these trees, both the male and female side, are found only in African populations. And because the length of the branches is proportional to the number of these mutational changes that have occurred over time, what that tells us is that Africans have been accumulating genetic diversity for longer than any other group. And therefore, that we as a species originated in Africa. Now, this is something that actually traces all the way back to Darwin. He said, OK, gosh, all the, most of the great apes that we look the most like are found in Africa. We sh probably share a common African ancestry with every other great ape. But then we're talking about, say, 20 to 23 million years ago, back to the origin of the great apes. Um, what's amazing from the genetic data is how recently we share that common African ancestry. It's not millions of years ago as physical anthropologists might have taught back in the 1980s, as recently as a generation ago. What the DNA evidence shows is that we all share an African ancestor who lived there within the past 200,000 years. And in fact, on the Y chromosome side, as recently as 60,000 years ago. That's only about 2,000 human generations. It's the blink of an eye in an evolutionary sense. Within the last 2,000 human generations, people have scattered to the wind from an African homeland populating the entire planet, migrating along the south coast of Asia, reaching Australia by 50,000 years ago, inland migrations across the steppes of Central Asia, moving into <coughs> Europe 35 to 40,000 years ago, a small intrepid group pressing north and east into Siberia, crossing a short-lived land bridge, the Bering Land Bridge, that existed between 15 and 20,000 years ago during the last glacial maximum, and populating the Americas. The great Paleolithic wanderings of our species and my goal as a scientist, and our goal as a project, the genographic project, is to fill in the details of how we made those journeys, why we made those journeys, and where we went, and try and bring it up as close as possible to the present day. So it's not simply how we first populated places like the Americas. What about the impact of, say, maize agriculture, corn agriculture, on population movements within the Americas? Questions like that. These sorts of questions are the ones that we're trying to answer in the Genographic Project, which we launched back in 2005. Now, like any big project, it has multiple things going on in it. Um, the core of it, though, is really scientific research. It's field research we're undertaking with a team of scientists around the world working primarily with indigenous and traditional populations living in their particular corner of the globe. Now, why indigenous and traditional groups? Well, think about your own ancestry. I'll think about mine out loud. Yours, perhaps, isn't as mixed up as mine is because, in fact, there are indigenous people in the UK. But most of the people in the US have moved there relatively recently. Okay, so my ancestors from all over northern and western Europe migrated over to the eastern seaboard of North America. I live in Washington, DC today. What does my DNA tell you about the ancient migration paths in any of these locations? It's really hard to say because I'm a mutt. And in fact, most of us walking around in the world today are mutts. We have very mixed ancestries. We know very little about the connection that we might have to the place where we live today. But there are people who've lived in the same place for a long period of time, hundreds, thousands, even tens of thousands of years. And they retain that, that geographic context for their genetic patterns that most of the rest of us have lost. The world's indigenous and traditional peoples. They give us an insight into their ancestors' genetic patterns the initial migrations into these locations, and the historical mi migrations that occurred prior to the age of colonialism, the age of um, expansion and exploration, if you will. So when we were designing the project, we didn't want it to just be this, the story of the world's 100 million, maybe 200 million indigenous people. We wanted to open it up to everybody, this whole concept of crowdsourcing, in effect, trying to crowdsource the genome. So we created the second major component of the project, public participation, allowing members of the general public who are curious about their own ancestry to send off for a kit, pay for it, we have to cover the cost of the testing, send off for a kit, swab their own cheek at home, totally anonymously, send in the sample, and a few weeks later on the internet, log in anonymously and get their results back. Find out how they fit into this human family tree something about their deep ancestry that they may not have suspected to become a part of a real-time scientific enterprise. 
which is kind of cool. It doesn't happen very often. It certainly didn't happen very often back in 2005 when we launched the Genographic Project. And I'll talk in a minute about the success of, of the public participation component. But in addition, by doing that, by becoming a part of this, by buying a kit, this is all nonprofit, it's National Geographic, you help to support the field research we're doing with the indigenous and traditional groups, but also the third critical component of the project, what we call the Legacy Fund. And this is a grant giving entity within the project that aims to give something tangible back to indigenous and traditional people around the world to preserve their culture. Turns out we're actually going through a period of cultural mass extinction at the moment that parallels the biodiversity crisis. Linguists tell us that of the 6,000 some odd languages spoken on the planet today, by the end of this century, between half and 90% will be extinct, gone forever. We're losing a language every two weeks through this process of globalization, mass homogenization, whatever you want to call it. People often forced to leave behind their ancient homelands, move to a growing megacity, their kids stop speaking the original language, the culture is dead in a generation or two. It's happening all over the world. And we, as a project, and certainly at National Geographic more broadly, feel very strongly that cultural diversity is what defines us as a species. Because it's really all we've got going for us, you know? We're not that cool biologically. We can't run as fast as a cheetah. We can't fly like a bird. We don't have warm fur like a snow leopard. But we can invent cultural means to do all of those things and send people into space and study our own DNA. That's what we're good at developing cultural means of expressing ourselves and solving problems. And when we lose these cultures, we lose an important component of what it means to be human. So through the Legacy Fund, we're trying to raise awareness about this, and in some cases, if we can, to slow it or even to halt it. We feel it's, it's truly a new model for doing a big scientific project. It's certainly a collaborative process among all the scientists, but also we feel a true collaboration with the indigenous and traditional groups, asking questions that they care about as well, using the tools of science to answer them. It's interactive. In the best sense of Web 2.0, it allows people to go onto our website, yes, find out more about the project, and actually join, become a part of it. Get out there on the ground with the scientists, if you will. And it's broadly culturally relevant. Yes, of course we publish in the peer-reviewed scientific literature. This is how science makes progress. You have to vet things with your colleagues. But once we've done that, we make an effort to get the story out in understandable terms to members of the general public because this is the human story. It has relevance for everybody walking around the planet today. It's something we like to think of as science 2.0. Okay, so I said we launched in 2005, so we're about seven years and a bit in, and the project is still very much ongoing. How are we doing? Well, let's just look at the numbers. That's one way to kind of parse this out. On the indigenous sampling side, we've got about 75,000 samples from more than 130 countries, over 1,000 populations, a pretty damn good cross-section of humanity's genetic diversity. Lots of cool science coming through, 34 plus publications so far. We've got dozens more that are in the pipeline. Really cool stuff coming out. Ancient population splits in Africa with groups driven apart by climate change. Uh, the genetic impact of the Phoenician Empire on the Mediterranean basin, and so on. Really cool science coming through. Now, on the public participation side, when we were designing the project, putting it together, leading up to launch, there were some people internally at National Geographic, including our CEO, who said, love the idea of this project, it's gonna yield some really cool scientific insights, I totally understand the indigenous sampling, nobody's gonna buy a DNA kit. You ain't gonna be able to sell any of these things, because nobody was doing that in 2005. You know, who was getting their DNA tested back then? Essentially nobody. And you know, those of us internally believed that there was a market for this. We believed that people actually wanted to connect to the indigenous people, see how they were related to other people and so on, become a part of the project, et cetera. The, the CEO actually made me a bet um, that we wouldn't sell 10,000 of these kits over the course of the next five years. So if you sell 10,000 of these, I'll give you a buck, I'll give you a dollar. He's a big spender, by the way. Um, <laughs> well, we sold 10,000 on the first day we hit 100,000 by eight months in, and we continue to sell 40 to 50,000 a year. It's been an amazing response. 450,000 people have joined the project, and not just joined the project, paid $100 each to do this. $45 million in gross revenue. Again, all nonprofit feeding back into the field research and into the legacy grants. 
We've given away $1.7 million so far, and again, this is very much an ongoing part of the project. Um, all over the world, 62 grants and counting. A couple of examples. Projects in uh, Tajikistan with the Yagnob people who speak a language known as Yagnobi. Uh, fascinating language for me. I've actually been out there and worked with these people myself. It is spoken by around 1,500 people who historically lived in the remote Zarifshan River Valley of northern Tajikistan. Most of them were resettled in Soviet days um, and just immediately post-Soviet in the early 90s down into the capital Dushanbe. And their kids, as I said before, are going to school in Tajik and learning Russian, but they're forgetting the original language, and that culture is doomed to extinction, as is their language. Now, they applied for a grant, which we gave them, uh, to develop some school curricula in the original Yagnobi language to try and convince the kids that it's worth maintaining this language. It's still a really cool thing to be able to do, to, sp to speak that language. Um, and now, why is it worth preserving this language spoken by maybe 1,500 people that's dying off in Central Asia? Well, it's because Yagnobi is basically the only relic of ancient Sogdian. Sogdian was the lingua franca of the Silk Road. So if you had been doing business anywhere between the Caspian Sea and the ancient Chinese capital of Xi'an 1,500 years ago, in the bazaars, you would have been speaking this language. So when that language dies, we lose an insight into that important chapter in human history. So worth preserving. I feel like. This is another great example, and this is one that's perhaps a little bit more pragmatic. If you know any, you know, as we would say in America, any Republicans who uh, perhaps don't think that it's worth preserving cultures in and of themselves, this is a really important reason for, I think, everybody. I think everybody would agree that this is a good idea. Shwar ethnobotany, the Shwar people living in the foothills of the Andes in Ecuador, trying to help them catalog the plants that they use traditionally for food, but also for medicine. And this is really important. Think about the drugs that you might be prescribed by your physician. Ultimately, 30 to 40% of those trace back to plant sources. And we often know about a lot of those plant sources because of accumulated traditional knowledge, thousands of years of trial and error, experiments being run in real time out there in the world. When that knowledge dies off, how many potential treatments for cancer or HIV might we be missing out on? Important to try and preserve this knowledge before it's gone forever. So that's, that's an introduction to the project. Um, lots of cool stuff coming through, as I said, lots of interesting science, and lots of insights into this whole idea of crowdsourcing and the power of crowdsourcing. Now, one of the things that we haven't really talked about is why would people get involved in something like this? Why would people be interested in looking at a you know, satellite image of a remote part of Mongolia and tagging things? Why would they be interested in doing anything in a citizen science project. Sorry to use that term, Susan. I think it's curiosity. Curiosity is what is driving people to do this. Human beings are innately curious. Every person is a natural scientist. We want to know about the world. We ask stupid questions. Why is the sky blue? Not such a stupid question at all. The reason Genographic has been so successful on the public participation side, on this crowdsourcing side, is because people are innately curious about their own past. They're getting something out of it. They're finding out something about themselves, something very personal, their genetic history. And they're also becoming a part of the project. So I think you need that curiosity. You need that payoff, that sense of learning something to really have a true crowdsourced or citizen science project. And this is a great example that came to light by accident um, in the first phase of genographic. I'm going to talk about the shift to phase two in a second. This is a woman who wrote into the project said, I love what you're doing, a couple of years ago, love what you're doing, lots of members of my extended family have tested themselves and think it's fantastic work, love the whole idea of supporting the legacy grant, you know, the, the work with the indigenous people. However, in my case, you appear to have gotten the result wrong. And I want you to retest me. Because you told me that I'm carrying a mitochondrial DNA type that comes from Central Asia or Siberia. And I can tell you for a fact I can show you church records going back to the 16th century that my ancestors came from a little village just outside of Budapest in Hungary, which is what you're looking at here. So I clearly have to have a Central European mitochondrial DNA lineage. I can't be Siberian or Central Asian. So please retest me. Thank you very much, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when I saw this email, I got really excited. Not because I like asking the lab to cherry pick one sample out of 450,000. They tend to get rather annoyed with me when I do that. 
but rather because the Hungarian people are fascinating. They are a linguistic outlier within Europe. Now, most of the languages in, spoken in Europe, um, traditionally, it belong to what's known as the Indo-European language family. So the language I'm speaking now, and German, Danish, Dutch, um, Italian, Spanish, French, you know, most of the European languages fall into this language family, which includes languages spoken in India, like Hindi, and Farsi spoken in Iran. It's known as Indo-European. There are a couple of outliers, though, within Europe. One is Basque, which, as far as we can tell, is unrelated to any other language spoken on planet Earth and could have come here from Mars. No idea where Basque fits in. There are lots of theories. And the other is Hungarian. And Hungarian actually does belong to another language family. It belongs to the Finno-Ugric branch. So if you look up there in Finland and the language spoke, spoken by the Sami people, the Western branch of what is actually known as the Uralic language family. Most of the languages spoken in that family are spoken east of the Ural Mountains, over in Central Asia and Siberia. And that makes sense, because we know that at some point around 1,000 years ago, a group of people known as the Magyars invaded Central Europe and brought with them their love of chicken paprikash and other things, actually that was later. But all things Hungarian, including their language, settled down there and bingo. That's the reason why Hungarian is spoken, is this little outlier right there in the Central European plain. Now, they had a huge cultural impact, completely shifted the language from whatever was spoken there before, probably something related to Slovakian or Polish. They must have had a big genetic impact, or some genetic impact, the problem is, when we've gone out and done our typical surveys, 50, 75 people from the population, Hungarian population, what do we see? They look exactly like the Poles and the Slovaks and the surrounding groups. So there apparently was no genetic impact at all from this massive invasion. Now, when I got the email from this woman, I, I started asking, you know, maybe we have more data now. We've got all these public participation samples. Maybe we have enough data to be able to see something. So I had my team pull the data on people with known Hungarian ancestry. And it turns out that about two to three percent of the lineages on both the male and female sides are Central Asian or Siberian in origin. Minimal genetic impact, very hard to detect, but with the power of 2,300 samples, you can see it. That's the power of crowdsourcing and that's the power of curiosity. Now, I alluded to the fact that the project is entering into a new phase, a phase we're call, calling Geno 2.0. And a couple of reasons for this. We'll talk about the, the most important one probably in a minute. Um, but a big one is that the technology in genetics is changing incredibly rapidly. Now, has anybody here heard of Moore's Law? I'm sure most of you have. The idea that computer chips are going to double in power roughly every 18 months. That's an unprecedented rate of technological change if you look back over human history. Turns out, though, that in my field, genetics, the rate of change is actually five times as fast. It's hyper exponential. So things that were cutting edge in, say, 2005, when we launched the project, the testing that we offered in the public participation side, the testing we were doing, the field samples, are now hopelessly out of date. Five times. To analogize it to the computer world, it's like using a 35-year-old computer. That's what a 35-year-old computer looks like. Now, if you wanted to, you could probably figure out a way to edit a film or play a cool video game on that. Be a little slow. But in reality, what we, what we want, of course, is to be using the latest technology, taking advantage of all of the advances that have happened over the last 35 years, or in my case, seven years. And so with that in mind, over the last year and a half, we have designed the equivalent of that brand new MacBook Pro, um, a computer chip, in effect, for your genome, scanning hundreds of thousands of positions across your entire genome, tons on the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, those are still really important markers, but also all the stuff that we were missing by just looking at those outside male and female lineages, all the people in that inverted pyramid of ancestors, your father's mother, your mother's father, and so on, that we couldn't see before. Scanning your entire genome very, very rapidly, very, very cheaply, providing, we hope, unprecedented insights into where we all came from. And this is something that we just soft launched or pre-launched or whatever you want to call it. We announced that people could buy the kit a couple of weeks ago. And the response has already been very, very good. And to give you a sense of, of the sorts of insights it yields, greater resolution, I needed a volunteer. I needed somebody who was a true explorer 
willing to step into the breach and try themselves with currently untested technology, see what came out of it. A guinea pig, in essence. And so I said, I know exactly the guy who should be doing this. My buddy, Bob Ballard, fellow explorer in residence and somebody who you may have heard um, talking over the phone yesterday. So we tested Bob's DNA um, a couple of months ago, ran it across this new chip, and got some really cool insights. Um, this is his Y chromosome pathway. He belongs to the lineage that I belong to, R1B1, which is the major Western European Y chromosome lineage. But one of the cool things we've built into the site is the ability to go in and interact with other people. And we've done this for a couple of reasons. Number one, people have told us we want to be able to interact on the basis of our shared genetic information. It's really important to build that sense of community. That's a great reason to do it. In addition, though, we have so many new markers on this chip. There are 13,000 Y chromosome markers, 10,000 of them currently unreported in the literature. We don't even know what the distribution is ourselves. They've been discovered in a couple of people, but we haven't actually gone out and mapped where they're found in the world. This is allowing the crowd to do that for us, the community section. So you pop over from your result, you're in the center, and people are arrayed around you in a circle. The ones closest to you in the circle are the ones who are most closely related genetically. And as you move out in the circle, they're more distantly related. And you can enter a little story telling us something about your father's or mother's side of the family. And the cool thing is, as people start to build these stories and interact with each other, they're going to see patterns, patterns that we as scientists wouldn't know to look for. Because again, curiosity about yourself is serving as an impetus to fill these things out, to go in and read them. You might find, as we did in Bob's case, that his particular R1B1 lineage is not just limited to Western Europe. It's really found in the British Isles and Ireland. And as time goes on and he starts to look in the community section, he might find that it's from a particular village in, say, Wales or Scotland. Really kind of nail down the details of where his Y chromosome came from and see who, you know, who are the people in the, the database that he's related to. But it's not just about the Y and the mitochondrial DNA. By the way, we're testing Neanderthal percentages. It turns out that there was a little bit of mixing between modern humans and Neanderthals as we were leaving um, Africa about 60,000 years ago. Regional percentages, so the, the autosomes, the rest of your genome, helping to tag populations that you're likely to be related to on the basis of these ancient components. So what you're looking at here looks kind of confusing on the face of it, but it is really a map of world history. If we had two hours, I could lead you through every single major migration event, the spread of empires, the spread of languages, just from this one diagram, an unprecedented insight into our history as a species. But let's simplify it. Let's look at Bob and his closest match in the database. Bob is closest to the UK population. He's the same rough percentages of, of his ancestral components. But Bob has something unexpected in his DNA. That blue component, the Oceanian component. What do we mean by Oceanian? This is near Oceania, so it's Australian Aborigine, Highlands of New Guinea, Melanesia, eastern part of Indonesia. And Bob's like, wait a minute. I mean, I'm an oceanographer. It's great to have Oceanian in me, but <laughs> how did I get there? And I started you know, asking questions about his genealogy, and it turns out that his family isn't purely British. His mother's side of the family is half Dutch. And of course, the Dutch had colonies over in that part of the world. And he had ancestors who were involved in that. And that's almost certainly how that little tiny sliver of a component came into his genome. And so he has become a monster on the genealogy side. He's asking questions of all the members of his family and assembling all this information. Anyway, just an example of the kind of really cool insights you can get from applying this new technology. And again, the power of the crowd um, and people's curiosity about their own past to generate novel scientific discoveries. So I'll go ahead and end it there. If you want more information, just go to genographic.com. Thank you.